Hey everybody, it's 8-Bit here, 8-Bit Music Theory, with a very unconventional video format for you today. Uh, I'm joined today by the uh, the ineffable Christopher Sue, and uh, because I wanted to break down some orchestration today, and I am not an orchestration, you know, expert by any means, Stop but I would like to be, be better at it, and so I got my friend Christopher Sue here to to uh to break down some zelda orchestration with me he has got a great youtube channel it's just your name christopher Siu, yeah, right? slayer, S-I-U. Name, <laughs> yes uh, i'll put a link in the description and he's got tons of great videos on you know orchestration on on uh, virtual instrument orchestration making you know your computer sound like a real orchestra he's clearly clearly knows what he's talking about and he has some great orchestration analysis too um so I, you know, everybody welcome Chris here today. Oh, thank you, man. It's, it's a pleasure being here. So uh, I'm really excited to dive into some Zelda music. Actually, something I, I don't know too much about. I just know the themes from, you know, Smash Bros. But oh. uh, this will this will be a, a, a whole new world. So it's super fun. Good. I'm throwing something new at you. But uh, totally. well, I thought thinking about like what would be a good, you know, choice to analyze the orchestration of when Skyward Sword, the Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword came out. I remember uh, Nintendo making a big deal about, you know, how it was a fully orchestrated soundtrack mm. for the first time in, in a Zelda game. It was the 25th anniversary of the series, I think, and so they, you know, wow. pulled out all the stops. And this this was also post Mario Galaxy, where Mario Galaxy was the first, like, fully orchestrated yeah. Uh, yeah. Mario game, so maybe they're following that example too. But for sure. The music at Skyward Sword, I haven't really talked about much on my channel, and a big part of its appeal is the orchestration. So sure. I thought this would be a perfect, you know, a perfect totally. <laughs> collaborative Absolutely. topic. So let's just, let's get into it. We, I picked the, uh, the sky, I think is what it's called. The mm -hmm. sky theme. And it's, um, just the hub world when you're flying around in the yeah. sky <laughs> music. Absolutely. Let's take a little listen to the first bit and then we'll, we'll start nerding out about it. <laughs> So, do you have any thoughts on the intro? Absolutely. Well, if we're just talking about the orchestration uh, to start with, I, I love how the atmosphere of the strings and the choir kind of have this really natural crescendo up to the top, right? I think that's probably the first thing that we hear, but then the the harp having these descending 16 sort of arpeggios, um, they, they kind of just add that texture and that movement, and it, it creates that magical adventure sort of feeling. And I think when we hear harp, we immediately start to hear like fantasy, Disney, magical sort of vibes. And um, it really co uh, contributes to that because other than that, we don't really get that much um, rhythmic movement, I think, aside from sort of like the low string and brass stabs on that G dominant there on the on the two and the four. Um, that's a really nice sort of emphasis moment. But those other rhythmic elements are really just coming down to the winds and the, and the harp sort of the coming down together it's interesting that harp line is yeah iconic <laughs> it's so beautiful yeah and and just to, i guess how it like complements the theoretical part too right the um mm. the it's it's kind of like a g pedal point um and by the way all, all these things i'm talking about were done prior to looking at the score so if there's a few discrepancies forgive oh. me but uh <laughs> yeah there's like there there's uh, the g lydian sound right because we have that a over g on the second chord, da, da, with that c sharp and then um and then I love that second last chord. It's like a D flat major chord. Um, so it's like the flat two before we hit that C major chord. And it just yeah. adds that touch of dissonance. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure you noticed that as soon as you heard that too. It's like so, so special. That Lydian sound, but specifically the third moving yeah. up to the raised fourth. Right. Like starting on just a straight G major and then moving up to this kind of A over G type sound. That totally has this perfect lifting kind of effect. Yes. You yes. know, which I thought was so perfect for like taking off this feeling totally. of taking off into the sky. Right. Um, and, and the orchestration, again, just lends itself to that moment as well. They, they really mm -hmm. capture that crescendo beautifully. It's like everything is just going up together and all yeah, of the true. dynamic is just swelling into the, the second yeah, half yeah, of the yeah. intro. So. And the harp kind of, I don't know, like the rustling of feathers or something, almost the yeah. texture of the, the harp arpeggios. Exactly. Not to get too... Uh, uh, impressionistic. <laughs> no, that's great. We, we need those imageries. <laughs> uh, <man. laughs> so, yeah, that's great. 
And then by contrast, moving into that, uh, the kind of main rhythmic uh, ostinato, I guess, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of that's all brass. It's all brass driven. It's yes. a totally different sound right away. Absolutely. Um, yeah, as soon as we hit the, the dun, 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 like that in itself, I think it, it's very similar to Mario music in a way where mm. um, the strings and the brass have a lot of the ostinato sort of role. I think the rhythms can be anywhere from like simple 16s, like, digga, 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 digga. but then this one has a bit more of that um, marching sort of deliberate uh, sound because it has that 16th rhythm, right? That, that dotted yeah, eighth yeah, to the 16th. Yeah, yeah. Dun, 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 mm. dun, 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 And then the syncopation of the, the end of the two, right? Winding the right. two and, right? So yeah. that there, that stresses that slightly totally. lilt forward and the brass are the perfect instruments to do that, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's, I, I like that. Um, I feel like that kind of, you know, dotted quarter, dotted quarter, quarter note, repeated rhythm. That's a, a very common... Uh, right driving rhythmic force in a lot of kind of orchestral modern orchestral music exactly but, but then, yeah f- you're totally right the march vibes with the dunk, yeah yeah dunk, totally dunk. Yeah, yeah. right right i was just gonna add on to that like i love how the second half of the intro has no uh, melodic content from bars three to seven mm. right it's just kind of laying the the land i guess and it, it kind of mm. matches the video game right because then you're you you can then focus on the visuals of what's ahead of you rather than right. letting the music dictate every single idea that you're trying to evoke i guess or trying to interesting yeah in front of you yeah definitely give some like breathing room and also yeah that sense of like coming off of this huge build up and release into the main ostinato it's like exactly just surveying the (laughs) the sky in front of you right i like uh, the tone yeah and that ostinato continues moving into the a section right uh melody which let's take a listen to that now let's do it Okay, so okay. for those eight bars, is yes. there anything that, that jumped out at you? Yes, yes. Well, the score is um, affirming what I thought, which I'm very happy about. But okay. um, I basically wrote down that uh, the fact that we have the strings and the woodwinds double together makes mm. it super, super strong. And I, I was listed, trying to figure out what the woodwinds were. I think it's actually the clarinet and the oboe double together. Um, the clarinet mm. has that very full-bodied a warm sort of sound, right? But the one thing is that it does not usually perform with a ton of vibrato, especially in like classical contexts. Um, so the mm-hmm. oboe lends that sort of pining emotional quality that does have that bit of vibrato in it. And so those two timbres when layered together, it's just a really beautiful thick texture that blends like perfectly with the violin section, I think. So I just wrote here, like the clarinet provides the body, the oboe creates sort of this emotion and the vibrato, and then the strings add that touch of lushness to the overall thing, which is then mm. backed by this accompaniment section of the brass and, you know, the low strings, probably cello and, you know, basses at the same time. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing that's totally outside of my scope of uh, expertise. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're totally, now that you say that, I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. I could totally right. hear that. But then I never would have thought that. Do you find it's, um, like, would you ever just double one woodwind and a string section? Or is that a a different kind of Mm. effect from what you're you're hearing here? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think that that actually really depends on whether you're working in a live setting or with virtual instruments. Because with virtual instruments, um, I mean, it also depends on the company that's recording the samples. But generally, you have a lot more flexibility when you're working with sample libraries. Because you can take um, one developer's string section, let's say, and then take a completely different developer's uh, oboe and clarinet, which could be recorded very upfront and close in the mix. So mm-hmm. if you layer those together, you're going to get a lot more of the woodwind sound, and the strings might act as more of that background texture, right? But um, so the the possibilities are endless. But yeah. in a more concert setting, it's it's more interesting because the strings typically are larger in a section, so they have their very wide, lush, homogeneous sound. And then the woodwinds, you might just have you know two flutes in the section or one oboe or something. And so right. those act as much more of a supplemental texture. So in this case, because it's a live recording, um, I think they actually mic'd up these these uh, two woodwind players probably got a lot closer, mm. and then they probably mixed it so that they had much more of a uh, a role in the right. texture of the sound itself you yeah. know, with the strings. Interesting. Oh, so it's like three different fields of study, yeah, orchestration exactly. and virtual instrument orchestration and totally. mixing yeah. you know, an orchestra. <laughs> it's all together. Really? 
Oh for sure, goodness. man. Yeah, it's it's great. And um, oh yeah, and then the the second half when we shift to that E flat major mm. passage from the C major, it's like that. Right. that it's like chromatic median, right? And um, we also changed the instrumentation to the trumpet, which has a very declamatory, again, like anthemic uh, sound. So it almost signals a change in the mood, which accompanies mm. that that cut to the E flat really well. Um, yeah. And then the piccolo at the very end there also helps cut through the rest of the dense arrangement when the 2D orchestra comes in. You get that super high da, 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 at the very end there through the yeah. piccolo. And you only need one of those because th those are really right. piercing in the <laughs> Any more than one might be too, too many It blows piccolos. your ears out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was thinking, I love the structure of the melody. It's very call and response. And I, yes. I think the orchestration plays into that where, yeah, you have this very woodwind focused, you know, with the string texture as well statement right. four bars and then you you know uh, uh an answering four bars that's yes. different in every way like different key different yes. instrumentation you know the right. structure of the melody is different and you know to get into the theory side the melodic motif the very first thing you hear is those upward uh fourths mm. from a to d to g and that again you get that that upward uh, motion of just yes. like bomb 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 you really feel you're rising up yes which you know <laughs> is thematically appropriate and then um the answering phrase starts with a big scalar walk down so mm -hmm. it's again all these kind of contrasting ideas um pitted yes. against each other i have a question for you like um sure. in in bar 12 where it goes like da 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 Mm. What do you think it would have a different effect if they stuck with the ascending in fourths motion, like G C F instead of B flat D F? Because I think it's interesting how you know when the theme starts, we have dun dun dun. It's the fourth, but here in this triplet on bar twelve, we we only go up in a triad. That is interesting. I think it it has a smoother feeling being an arpeggio, like third a third based <laughs> arpeggio. Right, right. I think we kind of tend to hear thirds or smaller as being like kind of one thing, one idea, just going up a, a chord, whereas right. the fourths stand out more. Totally. Um, and the fourth, like a stack of fourths doesn't imply any harmony. It has right. kind of its own separate kind of sound, whereas yes. just going up a B flat arpeggio over a B flat chord fits really nicely. It's not going to yeah. draw your attention Yeah, it's very traditional, right? Yeah. yeah. We might be spending too much time on too, too little music, but... <laughs> <laughs> this is the beauty but of it. I wanted to take... A second to point out the harmony for the for the audience here too, because it'll come back to be interesting later. It may, might not be that interesting now, but the the C bass pedal over the first half of the section, you have a C chord over a C bass note, and then a G chord over a C bass note, and then an E flat chord over a C bass note, and then another C chord. So it's just kind of like C, more colorful C major E sound, and then a C minor E, you know, borrowed chord sound, and then you resolve back. And then the answering phrase is mostly, like you said, in the key of E flat, but mostly over kind of like a B flat E chord, B flat E sound, um, which is the flat seven, which is kind of a classic Zelda theme, Zelda main theme sound. Like all the Zelda themes kind of use that root major tonic to flat seven motion. I didn't notice that at all until I really sat down and looked at the music and like, oh, that's the flat seven. That's such a Zelda right. thing, but it doesn't right. sound the way it usually sounds in Zelda scores. This theme in general, I find very different from most Zelda music, the score in general. It's so interesting. This score in particular has a lot of moments where you feel like maybe some of the chord changes are kind of random. And then you listen to a few more <laughs> bars. It's like, oh, okay, now we're, we're actually right. suggesting a different key, but then they bring us back to you know the tonic again uh the original key it's like that that's that's pretty genius actually and like yeah. i would love to come up with that myself you know <laughs> but, uh... well so the composer i did some little <clears throat> some sleuthing the composer is hajime yes. wakai who is like i i'm in love with his music i love his mm. his style but i was really surprised to hear that it was him because this is so different from his normal Ah. Not that I'm like, you know, his best friend or anything, but from what I've heard of him, he usually is a lot weirder with his music. Like he did the Pikmin soundtracks, the first two, gotcha. all by himself. And he worked on, I think, Star Fox 64 before that. And he worked on Wind Waker a little bit, but then Skyward Sword is the first Zelda game that he's done, like, did most of the work on, I think. Right. Knowing that it's him, you, I, those moments that you're talking about where it's like kind of a weird chord change or whatever... Mm -hmm. Uh, they make more sense where I'm like, oh, because the Pikmin soundtracks are full of that kind of thing. Where he cool. really was just going all out. <laughs> I love it. And then this is like, I feel like he's trying to fit into this heroic Zelda mold, but right. then his personal style like still pokes through in different, That's so different places. That's so interesting. Wow. So then after this eight bar section, the melody repeats 
mm -hmm. but with different arrangement and orchestration choices. So let's... Yes. Pretty nice. <laughs> Very nice. Oh yeah. The first thing I noticed was obviously the flute, uh, flute and piccolo, yes. double little little Tweety Bird. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that was perfect. <laughs> I love that description. Is that that's a pretty common orchestra thing to do, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Very adventurous. It's like when I instantly hear that, I just hear magical Disney scores, right? And okay. Yeah, usually yeah, yeah. they do totally. like runs up and down or even John Williams, right? He does that a bunch mm. in like, uh, you know, Superman, let's say, or really any adventurous sort of score. So yeah, the main purpose of these is really just kind of filling in the, the gaps where the melody might be holding a longer note. So it's mainly to mm. maintain the interest for the listener. It just adds a different texture, plays in a completely different range, super high up and it's a lot faster as well. So it, it feels like there's a lot of textures happening simultaneously. You know, it's like call and response in a way as well. The first time you hear the melody, there's a lot of just long held notes. Exactly. In the first yes. half, at least. Yeah. And then the second time you hear it, like you, you know, you might get bored unless there's right. something else to, to <laughs> totally. you know, that's interesting. Yeah. How do you feel yeah. about the brass additional counterline -y. I guess the trumpet specifically, the trumpet yeah. counterline. Yeah, no, I love it. And uh, actually what I had written down was actually at the very end of this section, mm -hmm. the French horns kind of do their do, 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 right, right in the yeah. bars 22, 23. And that you can hear very clearly as sort of a, a, a device to round up the rest of the section when, um, you know, the, the main trumpet line is holding that last note. So you just get these really, you know, conventional, but also creative choices in the orchestration where there's always something happening. And mm -hmm. like you said, in the, in kind of in the 2D section in bars, maybe like 19 or 20, there's yeah. just so much going on those full rich chords. And it feels like the entire theme, uh, even from the very first day section, it was all culminating like up to this point. So the brass really take the lead here. And then as they hit, bar 22 the downbeat dun, dun. then we start to kind of decrease in no way and the horns kind of uh decrease the intensity back down to let's say yeah. a three or a four out of ten yeah and i think adding that extra bar because this is a nine bar phrase compared yes. to this normal yes. eight bar that we heard before and yeah just that extra bar on the tonic c kind of gives right. you time to catch your breath Breathe, right? <laughs> relax yeah. a little bit totally I wanted to, for my theory nerd half, uh, that, that it. it's interesting that the harmony is totally different. Not totally different, but it's different this yes. time around than it was the first time, where I didn't even notice that at first, but then it starts on C the same way, and you still have a C bass pedal for the first half, and then the second half moves to a different key and the kind of call and response type thing. But instead of going from C to G to E flat over the C bass pedal, this time it goes C to B flat to A flat. And so having that A flat over C is like a way more dissonant, yes. way farther away from the home key than, than we yeah. went the first time. It doesn't stand out too much, but it's such a cool way to develop the, the same idea, like taking the general principles of how you made the chord progression and then just doing those principles in a slightly different way the second time. Right. And as you mentioned that, it, it makes a lot of sense too, because like C to B flat on the circle of his isn't too, too far, right? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, you're adding two flats, but then you go to A flat, it's like, oh, now we have four flats. Okay. Well, yeah. of course it's going to sound even more colorful, right? And then when we get that C major, finally, it just releases everything. It's like, okay, that was worth it. <laughs> totally. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, I was going to ask too. I have a question for you. Yes, yes. When you're writing orchestral music, from my own experience, it seems like there are way fewer notes just in terms of the actual like, <laughs> I don't know, like coming from a jazz kind of background and yeah. getting into orchestration through like Gil Evans and, and jazz arrangements sure. like that. It's sure. not uncommon to have like a 10 note chord or something right, or like right. for the bass line to be like. There are six different note names in this chord. Sure. <laughs> um, but then in orchestral music, it seems like it's mostly three. And yes. then like sometimes you step out a bit. And then in this score specifically, I was shocked at how many times you'd have a bar that just had two different notes mm. and like, you know, played by tons of different instruments in all these different yes. ways. So it sounds very full. Right. But I was like, oh, that's just like a D flat and an F. <laughs> that's yes. all there is in this bar. That's crazy to me. Yes. So is it like very hard to deal with major seventh chords and stuff with an orchestra? Do you have to, are there way more considerations to make or is it just the style that, right. that's not really as much a part of it? Yeah, I think ultimately you can honestly do whatever you want with the orchestra as you want, but 
and and that that's also the beauty of virtual instruments is that you can just experiment right. on your DAW, right? But um, the main additional consideration is just the overtone series because every single instrument has a different overtone series, right? And so, for example, something like the tuba with a very thick and full sound, if you stack multiple tubas on top of each other to create a chord, that's going to get muddy super, super quick compared to you if you did right. that with, let's say, a flute, which right. naturally is so much higher. The overtone series are not as layered, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very clear sound. So that's why usually when you're layering chords in the orchestra, you typically really only need a few notes because the overtones kind of fill up the rest of the spectrum anyway. Oh, I see. Um, so yeah, even if you just have like a regular octave on the bottom, let's say we're doing a C chord, C, C, and then maybe a fifth above that. So you still leave it relatively open with a perfect fifth. Then you have the third, a sixth above that. Then you have additional roots and fifths if you want to. But like you said, having even seconds in here, that's so effective and it tricks us into thinking the chord is bigger than it is because the textures of all the instruments combined together Mm. creates that huge sound, right? So it just proves that we don't really need all the notes of the chord. I asked because I noticed in bar 19 where it goes to D flat, it's actually like a D flat major seven chord. Yeah. I guess there was one major seven chord prior to this, but it's really interesting to see like there are tons of instruments playing the melody and then a bunch of instruments playing that big bass line. Bum, yeah. bum, bum, bum. Right. And then it's just the horns, I think, in the middle with the little third and seventh doing their little... Yes. And then it's like barely audible when you know listening to the actual piece of music but i was right. thinking like uh, i thought oh maybe that's the only way he could sneak the seventh <clears> in or something but you're right the perspective is probably i why would i need the seventh i already have this whole orchestra playing well chord, that, that yeah. actually <laughs> brings brings to mind as well yeah so when you have extensions and more color notes traditionally you would kind of want to reserve them for the high registers because the more colorful or crunchy a note is and the mm. lower you go the muddier it's going to get Right. Again, because of the overtone series. So you just want to make sure that your voicing is clear enough so that if you put in the extension, it's either like at the melody or one of the inner voices where it's like you maybe above middle C-ish um, mm. so it doesn't get muddied by everything else. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to remember that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So those were the A sections. This piece yes. has an interesting structure. The most video game looping music tends to be either like A-A-B or A-A-B-A. -A -A. And this one is A-A-B-B-C. Yes. And then it repeats the whole thing. So it's, yes. um, I guess the longer form makes sense for a, a piece that's supposed to play over and over while you're flying around the hub world. Like you're going to be there a while. So it makes right. sense that it's a little longer. But okay, so let's check out the B section. The B let's section I think is really cool. Yes. So let's see. Yeah, so the B Man. section, obviously a very different color palette used, you know, right off the top. Yes. Yes. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so first of all, theoretically, I, I love how um, it feels like a completely different section, but it still feels cohesive because we're only going from C to F major, right? And so yeah. they're, they're so close together. Um, and I just love how that split second before the B prime hits, I, I call it B prime when the theme comes back, uh, we mm. get that that quick, quick moment. It's like the da, 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 like da, that, that in the yeah, brass, yeah, yeah, I yeah. forgot which bar that was. I think it was this bar. In all these things, the voice leading is so, so smooth and so yes. smart of like the D flat and A, a flat going up and down respectively to C and A, like such a yes. smooth little half step. Yeah, it's so, so satisfying. Good. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, regarding the orchestration, yeah, now, now we kind of move down a couple octaves, right, from super mm. high. Now right. we're kind of in the middle register, even just below. So I wrote down cellos and bassoons, it sounds like, doubling together. Those are a very natural pairing. You could also do cellos on like French horns if you want to bring in the brass. Very oh, warm, okay. sort of similar timbres. But yeah, cellos and bassoons have a very you know warm, dark sort of sound. And uh, you'll also notice that probably in the higher register, there's not as much going on. Because again, the lower we go, the easier it is to get muddy. So the, the oh, more I sparse see. you can make an arrangement when there's lower mel uh, oh. melodic stuff happening, the the smarter that's going to be because you want that to come out. Oh, interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because there's obviously a lot of space around the melody because yes. you don't want to get in the melody's way. But then, yeah, even above the melody, it's way less busy than it was, you know, f yeah. five bars ago. It's like literally just repeated triads over and over in eights, right? And you get those mm -hmm. woodwinds going, da, 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 da. it's just like those broken chords and that's yeah, literally yeah, yeah. it for the rhythmic. Totally. Tommy. Yeah, and the woodwinds being so far above... Uh, there's tons yes. tons of space 
Yeah, and the the xylophone coming in to double the little woodwind. Bum, bum, yes. bum, bum. It's such a f- fun little texture. It's such a common move to move to the four chord for the bridge that when the F chord hits, I still am like, oh yeah, we're in C still. Oh, and right, then in the right. next bar when you get that True. B flat minor <laughs> over F, it's like, oh, we're not in oh, C yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> It's a really short thing, I guess, but having F to B flat minor over F, back to F, mm-hmm. you still have the bass pedal. That's an idea that's taken from the A section. You have yes. that kind of stepping out of the key chromatically and coming back. That's an idea from the A section melody, but right. it's a totally different version of those same ideas. I don't know. I thought I love this part. The melody is beautiful. The big yeah. like leaps in the in the melody and the cello. I it might just be a, a cello sucker. Like I love. Uh, <laughs> well, here you wrote melodies. oboe plus bassoon, so that's that's a pretty interesting texture to add there to bar twenty eight. Yeah, I really it love that. It starts just cello for four bars, <clears throat> and then the bassoon Lucky, yeah. comes in, and then the oboe doubles like an octave up, I guess. Yes, or yes, maybe, yes. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the chords I was talking about before, where it's just E and B flat in the very last mm. bar of the B section. It's mm. only two notes in every voice it's either it's a b or a b flat or an e yeah. which i'm like that's not a chord <laughs> that's just a tritone <laughs> but it then. totally it doesn't oh, sound yeah. like like it totally yes. fits with the flow of the music I don't right. Know. right 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 interesting to me okay so let's check out the next b prime yes Should I stop there? <laughs> Let's stop there, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, there's so a lot that goes on after that. Oh, man. So this is, again, another... It's the same formula, almost, where it starts the same way as the last B section, and yeah. then the second half, it goes somewhere totally different. Or not totally different, but there's a little twist on it that you weren't uh, maybe expecting. Yeah. That C chord gets me every time. <laughs> just like where did that come from it's like i thought we were in e major for a second it's like c to a major like totally. what are you doing <laughs> yes. oh, oh just kidding oh <clears throat> it's crazy it's yeah it's smart genius. yeah bumping up to that c sharp minor stepping yes. out of the key of f into key of e by way of c sharp minor then right. up to e and then it's an interesting like uh it's not like very harmonically clear i guess like the right. melody isn't going e major chord to a c major chord or whatever That's you know true. it's very yeah. like it's very floating over top in a way that totally fits um, yeah. yeah 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 fits over both worlds but doesn't commit fully to either one it's an interesting way of writing well now that you say that 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 makes a lot of sense like the, the c major chord here at the end he could have easily just done a d major chord right because the melody is just a d major scale descending totally it would so... like fit the chord better you yeah know, or more maybe. uh maybe better uh, right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. but then but, instead uh, we get that kind of sea uh, lydian yes 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 so yes. colorful it's so pretty uh, yeah and like orchestrationally there's i don't think there's a lot different happening here so i think he really is just yeah. relying on the musical devices to carry this mm. forward really and it's nice. a good way to build this kind of like surprising harmonic yes. moves they're a good way to build up to the end the yeah, yeah, yeah. the outro bit before the loop back to the beginning which is right. full of it's almost exclusively surprising our mind. I know, moves. it's like ear candy. It's so good. Yeah. Okay, let's check it out. <laughs> and that's the loop. That's <laughs> so the beginning. Good. I feel like I've heard this a couple times in video game music specifically is mm-hmm. this kind of texture of like i don't know what you call it uh it sounds like um uh, cheeky woodwind mm. you know mm. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> how to explain yes, it yes, yes. but because right. you know there's like a bar of just like woodwinds and then a bar of the whole rest of the orchestra answering yeah. and then a bar right. of woodwinds and then the whole rest of the orchestra answering yeah i I would say that's pretty common. Yeah, I mean, I guess ultimately it just depends on what you're trying to go for. Like what ty- what sort of emotion or, you know, effect are you trying to go for? So the woodwinds here, it definitely feels more 
comedic or maybe light or just mm. even mysterious in a way. It's like almost you're tiptoeing or something, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah um, totally. You might also add in, I don't know, pizzicato strings or tremolos if you want to make it more suspenseful. But in this case, it's it's very clearly like just the woodwinds kind of tiptoeing around. And so it's very quiet. The energy level is really low. And then, like you said, the contrast with the rest of the orchestra, it just brings it up to a 10. And then, you know, we get the opposite again. And then bring that in with the time signature change as well. That's like just everything is just happening at the same time here. <laughs> it's great. It's like building up. It's The music is crescendoing in a way, but not in a way that's actually getting louder, really. Yes. I mean, like it comes down a lot for this pure just woodwinds bit. Yeah, and then the full orchestra accents are obviously louder, but that right. that the time signature shifts and the kind of bouncing around to different sections of the orchestra, like the focus bouncing around, it, it that all helps build tension too, you know. Totally, I, I will say, I'm not a fan of the, like the loop, like the way right, the, right. the way it ends and then goes back to the beginning feels so it, awkward to me. It, I can't it does believe not that sound supernatural. That's... You're right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Like, couldn't you have put in like one more bar to try and? I mean, you know, right. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk. Uh, tell, <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell. Well, no, no, you have job, a but... point. You have a point. Like, it's <laughs> it's C, literally C sharp minor going to G major. Yeah. So yeah, that is kind of a big tritone shift there, a, isn't it? And there's a, like a D in the bass in the last note. Yeah. yeah. But it's uh, again like a very clear like c sharp minor triad over a d which is a right. really weird sound and yes so, yes like if you had moved to like a d7 right would be the, the most obvious way to that's do it. true yeah or even like uh i could see like to an a flat over d or something like some if there wasn't a c sharp in a bunch of different voices <laughs> on that last chord <laughs> it would be an easier <laughs> transition i think but right that's something that you don't see outside of huge ensemble music is the because you just don't have the ability to like take an idea and bounce it around a bunch of different sections mm. like that's a really mm. cool effect you know it this is. Uh, in, in bar 44 this guy like walking down uh, yeah in yeah. the brass I'm... then like trades off to the low brass exactly exactly yeah. yeah and i'm just about this c sharp i'm just wondering maybe it's because he started this section in like you know with an a sort of sound so maybe he wanted to maintain right. this sort of a major a lydian sort of feeling for the mm. rest of the section for you know that shift but there's yeah. also stories of composers coming up with a ton of material and then the producers kind of chopping it out some of it oh. out unnecessarily to like find loop points and stuff so I, I i don't know if this is entirely his decision the loop point but you know no like, yeah i mean there's so <laughs> many moving parts in this kind of yeah. project that i would never say like hajime wakai you dodo yeah, bird yeah, yeah. why did you do that but, <laughs> what was know. that transition <laughs> right 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 <laughs> But also, it is not a satisfying transition in the final mm, <laughs> product mm. for whatever reason. Right, right, right. Well, cool. Do you have any other uh, points that you want to bring up about this tune? No, um, I think just overall, the the full ensemble throughout just sounds super satisfying. And the fact that we get so many contrasting uh, ensembles is, is like I said, re like really satisfying. Because you get those woodwinds playing on their own, but then you get the full orchestra coming back and you get... You know, double strings of women's together. You get brass playing counter melodies and uh, call and response themes, and it's just, uh, yeah, really, really creative. And there's always something to listen to and grasp onto. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's controlled complexity, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's really a jam-packed minute and a half of music for sure. Totally. <laughs> okay, well, if any of you guys watching want to get better at this, if you wanted to to be better at orchestration, if you want to learn how the masters do this kind of thing. <laughs> If you want to try and absorb some of Chris's mastery into your own <laughs> oh, into your own brain, you, oh, he gosh. has something for you that you might want to check out. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, yeah, there's uh, something I put together um, a little while ago, and I call it uh, Orchestration Essentials. And um, because orchestration and even virtual orchestration with like sample libraries and technology can be so overwhelming, um, I kind of tried to break down for my students like the most basic essential orchestration tips you need to know about, you know, um, voicings and doublings and uh, using your virtual instruments and uh, kind of like a step-by-step -step process of how you want to approach your orchestrations, um, not only just through like, let's like, say notation software, but like also in your DAW. So, um, so like really important considerations there that if you're interested in trying orchestration in your computer, um, it might be uh, really fun to kind of keep on hand and then refer to when you're working on your mock-up. So um, I, I have a custom link for you guys. I think I'm calling it like ChristopherCU.com slash 8-bit. So uh, you should be able to grab that for free. Just uh, click below. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. My great. pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> well, 
thank you guys so much for watching hope you enjoyed it thank you again chris for coming on and sharing thank your you. insight everyone go check out his channel he's got lots of hot tips <laughs> and uh yeah i'll see you all in the next one <laughs> take care guys bye